Welcome to this mini gem brought to you by the Association for Elderly Medicine Education, where we'll be getting to grips with the common issue of the hyponatremic patient. The aim of this mini gem is to understand the clinical importance of a low sodium, to recognise the severity, some of the symptoms, and to appreciate the common causes, to try and simplify the investigative process in your head, and to learn how and when we manage this. Hyponatremia can be defined in two main ways. The first is the level of the sodium, and the second is the rate at which the sodium level has fallen. A level that has fallen more quickly is often responsible for more severe symptoms and signs. Signs and symptoms of hyponatremia are varied, especially in the elderly. Some patients have no symptoms, whereas others may have fatigue, nausea, falls, muscle aches or be confused. At the more severe end of the spectrum, hyponatremia can contribute to reduce conscious levels and even seizures. To understand hyponatremia, we have to appreciate that it is largely a disorder of water balance rather than sodium balance within the body. Osmolality is a measure of how much of one substance is dissolved in another substance, for example sodium in water. The greater the concentration of substance dissolved, the higher the osmolality. For example, very salty water has a higher osmolality. It is maintained at a fairly constant level by a feedback mechanism between the hypothalamus and the kidney using antidiuretic hormone or ADH to regulate either conservation or excretion of water by the kidney. ADH release responds to plasma osmolality changes blood pressure and blood volume changes. Normally, a high osmolality or concentrated blood will stimulate ADH release to conserve water. A low osmolality will do the opposite. A low blood pressure or low blood volume will also stimulate ADH to try to conserve water within the body. Here's an approach I find useful when assessing a patient with hyponatremia. Firstly, take a good history. Have they been unwell recently, in particular with infection or diarrhoea and vomiting? Have they started new medications, such as diuretics or medication for anxiety or depression? Next, examine the patient. Have a look at their JVP. Are they very edematous? Look at their fluid chart for intake and output. Is their tongue dry or moist? Now you can make a reasonable judgment of their fluid status. Are they losing excess salt or water, for example, post-abdominal surgery? Repeat the sample to check its accuracy if it is anomalous. Remember that in patients with high glucose levels, the sodium can be falsely low. Do some further tests. Key ones to get off to the lab as soon as possible are serum osmolality, urine osmolality and urine electrolytes. Now we're going to think simply about the three main forms of hyponatremia. The first is hypovolemic hyponatremia. Here, the total body water and sodium are reduced, so antidiuretic hormone acts on the kidneys to retain water. The causes of this are gastrointestinal losses, third space losses and burns. The other cause are diuretics and salt wasting disorders where fluid and sodium are lost. These patients often need replacement of fluid with 0.9% saline and the rate and volume of which will depend on the clinical picture. The second patient is the hypervolemic hyponatremic patient, where total body water is increased, in particular the extracellular fluid volume. These patients may have an organ failure, in particular cardiac or liver failure. In these patients, cardiac output may be reduced. This leads to a reduction in effective circulating intravascular volume, which is detected by the baroreceptors, causing a release of ADH in response to perceived low intravascular volume. This then leads to further retention of fluid. These patients may often need fluid restriction. The euvolemic patient with low sodium is often more difficult to assess. Total body water is increased, though they may have a normal amount of fluid outside the cells. One cause is from excessive water consumption, or primary polydipsia. Other causes are endocrine disease, such as Addison's or hypothyroidism, or more commonly, antidiuretic hormone release due to intercurrent illness or underlying pathology. 
ADH is released in many acute circumstances and includes the syndrome of inappropriate ADH release, which we will discuss. Euvolemic patients with low sodium are managed by treating the cause. The syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone excretion is a diagnosis of exclusion. There are many causes, including infection, malignancy, medication and intracerebral disease. Always combine the results with the clinical picture. And remember that if the patient is on diuretics, this makes the results more difficult to interpret. Let's take a look at the urine osmolality result. If it is low, this means we have dilute urine, and causes for this may be excess fluid intake. If the urine osmolality is higher, then we have to look at the urine sodium level. If the amount of salt in the urine is low, the patient may be retaining sodium and water, such as in heart and liver failure, in which case they may have an increased fluid status when you assess them. If, however, you think the patient is dry when you assess their fluid status, they may have lost sodium and water elsewhere, for example via the GI tract or via third space losses. Let's look at if the amount of sodium in the urine is higher. Higher sodium in the urine can be caused by diuretics or renal disease. If the patient is not on diuretics or does not have significant renal disease, they may be experiencing what we call a salt wasting disorder or an endocrine disorder, such as Addison's, in which case the patient's fluid status may be low. If the patient is euvolemic with a higher level of sodium in their urine, this may be representative of an SIADH, or a secondary adrenal insufficiency, such as reduced ACTH production. Take the time to go back over this chart, and perhaps take a screenshot so you have an easy-to-access point of reference for when you next see a patient. When managing the patient, if the hyponatremia is mild, chronic or the patient is asymptomatic, you may not need to do anything and you can discuss this with a senior. If it is severe or the patient's conscious level or neurology is affected, seek immediate help as these patients can be very unwell and may need to be managed in an HDU setting. Bendroflumathiazide can be safely suspended. However, discuss with a senior before withdrawing any psychiatric medications and do not start any medications to raise the sodium levels such as demeclocycline or Vaptans unless you have discussed this with an endocrinologist. Patients with moderate to severe hyponatremia need regular blood test monitoring, usually once or twice daily, to ensure it is not falling lower and also to ensure it is not rising too quickly. We aim to correct the sodium fairly slowly by no more than 8 to 10 millimoles in 24 hours. Central pontine myelinolysis is a severe consequence of a rapid rise in sodium in patients who have adjusted to a subacute or chronic hyponatremia. It is damaged to the nerve cells in the brain as a response to fluid shifts. It presents with neurological symptoms two to three days after hyponatremia is rapidly corrected, varying from drowsiness and dysarthria to coma and locked-in syndrome. So let's review our learning outcomes. I hope you have understood the importance of detecting and managing hyponatremia. We have looked at recognising the severity symptoms and causes of hyponatremia. I hope that now you can recall a simplified approach to investigating hyponatremia with blood and urine tests and also have a better idea of how to manage your hyponatremic patient. For further reference, NICE have produced guidelines on hyponatremia and please now click on the link below from the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh website to access a really good paper on hyponatremia. Thank you.